Hello friends, this is Fanfic Adventure, how are you all? So in this video, we will see, what if Naruto was a a true immortal? Here is short summary, born 2000 years ago, Naruto Uzumaki is turned into a true immortal by his wife Ketsuya, after being poisoned by Silas. He uses his new gifts to serve as the protector of all witches. But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time, let's begin the story. Sitting cross-legged in the middle of a forest during a storm in ancient Greece was a young man. He chanted to himself as the thunder cracked overhead and the heavy rain pelted his skin as it had for the last hour. He focused his magic and the storm that he had created faded away to reveal clear skies with a warm sun shining down on him. Standing up and muttering a quick spell, he was dried off as if he had not been in the rain for the last hour. When he turned around, his spiky blonde hair, blue eyes, and whisker marks could be seen by all. This was Naruto Uzumaki, he had been given a new lease on life after he failed to stop Kagaya. They had been fighting her when Sasuke got hit with one of her ash-killing bones. Without Sasuke, Naruto had no hope of resealing her, so he soldiered on for as long as he could until he could no longer muster the energy to even raise a finger. Kagaya had stared at him for several moments before ripping out the chakra of the tailed beasts and performing an odd jutsu on him that caused him to fall asleep, and when he came to, he had just come out of his new mother's womb. Naruto had had a far better life in this new world. Humans didn't have chakra, and only certain members of humanity had magic. He was lucky enough to be born with it, and he belonged to a group of witches called the Travelers, a group that practiced pure magic. It turns out, he was well liked by his community, and since he did not have any trying to sabotage his education, he found he was a prodigy with magic, and grew very intelligent. His power was so great that he could control the weather and turn night into day. His magical power and talent were matched by one person, his best friend, and his fiancée, Ketsia. A few years ago, he and his mother had decided to travel for a bit, and they got mixed up in some business in Capua in the Roman Republic. His mother was killed, since travelers sealed their magic once they left the community, and he was sold into Rai to become a gladiator to Quintus Lentulus Badiatus, arriving at the same time as a man named Spartacus. He made friends with Spartacus, helping him convince the other gladiators to revolt. He stayed with them afterwards, using his skills to help them against Sepius's men and later Glaber, when he came to Capua. Spartacus had been a good man and trusted friend, in fact, he was the only one Naruto ever revealed the existence of his magic to outside of the travelers. Naruto fought in many battles from their battles with Glaber to the war against Crassus and Caesar. He was with Spartacus at the end when he fell in their final battle against Crassus. In his anger, he swore revenge against Crassus, Caesar and later Pompey Magnus, before making his way back to Greece, where the travelers resided. While he was settling back down and getting over his PTSD, he had learned that Ketsia's original fiancé, and his other childhood friend, Silas, had cheated on Ketsia with her bastard sister, Amara, while also stealing Ketsia's original immortality elixir. Which, Naruto didn't really get, because Amara, to Naruto, was plain while Ketsia was many times more beautiful. Plus, Amara was just a. Naruto had to stop her from killing Silas and Amara for their betrayal and convinced her to just let them be. They weren't worth wasting any magic on, especially since Silas no longer had magic. He walked back into the village square to see Ketsia sitting in pavilion, looking up and flashing him a smile as she stood up. They wrapped each other in their arms and ed each other passionately. Only one day left, Ketsia said as they separated, referring to the fact that they would be married in a few days. Yes, my beloved Ketsia, in one day, we will be married, and we can begin our new lives together. Naruto said with a smile. It was then he noticed her glaring at Silas and Amara. You shouldn't have convinced me to let them be. Ketsia snarled. Ketsia had fallen in love with Silas during the years that Naruto was gone in Rome, and at the time, she thought he was as well. Little did she know of the Silas's selfish, cruel, and immoral nature. He manipulated her into creating immortality, and then he stole it from her to give to himself and Amara, her servant and bastard sister, who honestly was not even that attractive to begin with. 
Silas did not understand and did not care how much he had hurt her. It was like her had torn out her heart, ripped it to pieces and pissed on the remains. Like I said, they are not worth it. Besides, what are they going to do? Silas no longer has any magic and even when he did, he was never in our league. Naruto said, thanks to his education, he was more aware of people than he was in his first life. While Silas was his friend, Naruto had noticed the looks of jealousy whenever Naruto outdid Silas in the field of magic. Which was pretty much every time. Silas, while strong, couldn't do what Naruto could do. Thanks to his Senju blood, Naruto had a predisposition for the elements and plant life. Naruto created the forest that protected the travelers and served at their home when he was twelve and he created an entire garden of various beautiful flowers for his wedding, mostly just to show off. Well, when you put it like that, Ketsia smiled as they shared another. Unknown to them though, Silas was plotting something. Silas didn't like that Naruto, his former friend who Silas was always jealous of, was marrying Silas's old fiancé, who had the power to undo the immortality that Silas and Amara had stolen. So, Silas the betrayer, decided to do something about it. The next night, it was now the night of Naruto and Ketsuya wedding ceremony and every single one of the travelers were gathered. Except for Silas and Amara. They had been disinvited for obvious reasons. Who comes before the gods? The priest officiated. Ketsia, a woman grown and flowered comes seeking the favor of the gods, Ketsia's father said. And who claims her? The priest officiated. Naruto of clan Senju claims her. Naruto said with a loud clear voice. Lady Ketsia, the priest said. Do you take this man? Yes, Ketsia said as she smiled. I take this man. And you Naruto of clan Senju, will you take this woman? and honor her and provide for her as long as you both shall live. I will, Naruto said. Well, we can't have that now. Interrupted a voice he did not want to hear. Naruto turned from Ketsuya to see Silas and Amara casually walking toward the altar. Silas, Naruto growled, what are you doing here? You were not invited to attend the ceremony. Well, isn't it obvious, old pal? Silas questioned, I'm crashing the party. Just then, Naruto felt a blade slip into his stomach, he turned to see the priest with his hand on the blade. Naruto pushed the priest away and pulled the blade out, using his magic to heal himself. You wretched vile monster, Naruto convinced me to spare your lives when you betrayed me and this how you repay me. By ruining my wedding, again, and trying to kill the man I love. Ketsuya shouted in anger, well, not this time. Ketsia raised her hand and Amara and Silas doubled over in pain. You can't kill us, we are immortal, Silas groaned. I don't have to kill you, I just have to stop your heart from working. Ketsia said as Silas, to his horror, saw Amara turning grey. No, Amara, Silas shouted as his love turned into statue. Kill her, five compelled witches were forced to obey him. Naruto, still healing his wound, clenched his hand and roots sprung up from the ground wrapping themselves around the compelled witches, draining away the compulsion. I will make stop flowing in your veins, I will make your veins dry up, until you rot from the inside out. And the world will see you exactly as you are. A cold, grey, hideous monster. Ketsia growled as Silas fully desiccated and flopped to the ground. Next time I want to kill someone, Ketsia says. I won't stop you, Naruto said before he felt weak and hacked up black blood falling unconscious into the ground as Ketsia and the travelers, now free of Silas's control, rushed to help him. Later, the witches examining Naruto left the room of the home that Naruto and Ketsia were planning on living in together. How is he? Ketsia's father asked. He's dying. He's been poisoned by a very special poison that is immune to treatment through magical means. All of our attempts to treat him have failed. I know this poison. I've seen it used once by Silas's grandfather. It's a recipe his family jealously guarded. The medical witch said. What can be done? Surely there is antidote. Ketsia asked. There is, but the recipe was destroyed, likely by Silas. He clearly wanted Naruto to suffer and ensure he died. Normally, the poison kills within hours, but Naruto has managed to survive a full week, thanks to his great power, but he can't last. He can no longer move or speak, he's in so much pain. I'm sorry. He only has a few days. The medical witch then left them alone. No, 
Ketsia vowed with tears in her eyes. I won't let Silas take him from me. With that she headed to a separate room of her new home with Naruto and began preparing an elixir. A few minutes later, her father walked in on her. Daughter what are you doing? He asked. I'm not losing the man I love. Silas will not take him from me. Ketsia said to her father. I know daughter, but you can't save him, not in high. He stopped himself when he realized what her plan was as the elixir now held an ethereal blue liquid. You're going to make him immortal. It's the only way to save him. Ketsia said as she wove further magic into the spell. You can't break the laws of nature again. Her father was vehemently against that sort of thing. Father, the whole coven needs him. The lichens have started to make incursions past the tree's protective barrier. It's only a matter of time before they reach us. We need him. Ketsia said and her father stilled at that. The lichens were large bipedal wolf men that were dangerous, infectious and savage beasts seemingly incapable of thought or reason. They were vicious animals that lived for the hunt. They possess enhanced senses of smell, hearing, and sight that are superior even to those of wolves, not just humans. Lichens also possess physical strength, durability, reflexes, and speed superior to those of humans, and can break through thick stone walls with relative ease. It had been Naruto that created the thick dense forest that the travelers resided in that kept the lichens from hurting the coven, but it was starting to fail. How would that help him? Her father asked, as he watched the liquid turn a brilliant golden yellow. I'm not just going to make him immortal with mental powers like Silas was. I'm going to make him stronger and faster than the lichens. He will also be allowed to keep his magic and he won't be capable of being killed by anything. Ketsia informed him as she finished the elixir, after weaving a powerful protection spell into the elixir so he would be immune to death from any means, be it human, supernatural, or otherwise. Ketsia's father let her go, as while he didn't believe witches should mess with nature, they needed Naruto to continue defending the coven from the attacks. And he loved his daughter too much to let Naruto die. Days later, Naruto, now fully healed and immortal, and Ketsia had returned to their separate home after their second wedding ceremony that went off without any interruptions this time, yes. Yes, more. Ketsia moaned as Naruto ed in her. Naruto continued to slam his into her a bit harder with his hands firmly gripping her hips as she threw her ass back for him, as they had been unable to make it to their bedroom before they had begun. She moaned his name, begging for more which he granted. His pace and power increased, and he hoisted her back against his chest as he pumped into her. Naruto. She screamed out, coming for the third time, since they started. She reached back and ran her hands through his spiky blonde hair. He could feel his limit fast approaching, and he gave a grunt as he came closer and closer with each thrust. All at once, Naruto lost it as her walls suddenly tightly clamped down onto his. Ketsia slumped out of Naruto's grasp and back onto her hands and knees while she slowly ground her ass for him, biting her bottom lip and looking back at him seductively as she did so. Naruto wasn't finished as he quickly flipped her onto her back, and lined himself up before pushing back inside. O-U-N-H, Ketsia cried out as Naruto gave a growl as he appreciated her hot tight walls. Ketsia wrapped her arms around her husband and pulled him for A. He then pulled her onto his lap, thrusting upwards into her. She cried out coming again as her nails raked over his back, leaving lines and even cutting him which quickly healed. Naruto took a breath as he lost himself in her in her a second time that night, and her eyes rolled back as she came once more. He then dropped her backwards, deciding to take a break. Ketsia looked like a mess though, her beautiful dark curly hair clung to her sweaty face and splayed out seemingly everywhere. Her chest heaved up and down, her twitching every other moment. Seeing her like this made a switch flip and Ketsia gave a moan as she felt her husband's regain its hardness and thickness inside of her. She peeked an eye open and couldn't help but give a small giggle as he hovered over her and ed her while resumed to pound into her. Her tired legs wrapped around his waist while she moved to him. I love you so much, Ketsia said panting, as Naruto smiled and ed her. Things got much better after Silas and Amaro were defeated and Naruto was turned into a true immortal, though Naruto, angry that Silas had spit on his mercy, created the other side, a supernatural limbo for all supernatural creatures, by linking it to Amara, making her the anchor. He then dropped Silas in a tomb on an island 100 miles from Nova Scotia with the cure that Ketsia made, 
so that Silas would take it and be forced to spend eternity apart from Amara. Together, after Naruto fought them off for ten years, the two of them were able to perform a spell that devolved the lichen species into werewolves, so that they would be bound by the power of the moon and much weaker, before transporting them all to another continent. Naruto and Ketsuya were happily married for sixty years, and had twelve children of their own, and five times as many grandchildren. Even though Naruto remained young and healthy while Ketsuya aged, he stayed with her until the very end, where she begged him to look after witches, to watch over them, protect them from abuse and make sure that they did not abuse their gifts, or make the same mistakes she had where Silas was concerned. She also encouraged him to love again, to not let her death hold him back from living his life. One thing Naruto had done across the years and finally accomplished in 44 BC, was get his revenge for Spartacus. He had made certain that the Parthians knew of the movements of Crassus's army when he tried to conquer Parthia, and personally poured the molten gold down Crassus's throat, as a mockery of his for wealth and his greed. Naruto and Ketsuya had been on vacation in Egypt when Pompey came begging for help after his army was soundly crushed by Caesar, personally being the one to remove his head and Naruto personally came to Rome on March 15 in 44 BC to finish what he started when he murdered Crassus. March 15, Rome, 44 BC, Julius Caesar entered the Senate where, after having a friendly greeting with Brutus, he was approached by a senator called Tillus and he asked Caesar to see if his brother could return from exile with the request being denied by Caesar, which led to Tillus pulling down Caesar's toga. The action angered Caesar before he turned around only to stop a knife stab from another senator, which only angered Caesar more as that senator called out to the rest of his friends where entire group of senators started stabbing Julius Caesar from all angles. Julius Caesar tried to fight back, but, he fell due to his wounds. Julius Caesar struggled to stand when the senators began to act robotic-like and parted ways to reveal a man in a black toga. And at last, we come full circle. I've been waiting nearly 26 years to get my hands on you, Julius Caesar. Julius recognized the man from when Julius had fought with Crassus and defeated Spartacus. You, Julius said, recognizing the man who had not aged a day. Yes, me, Spartacus's friend, he was my closest friend, and you and Crassus butchered him. It was rather fun, pouring the molten gold down Crassus's throat, and watch the pharaoh of Egypt kill Pompey on my orders. But I wanted to kill you myself. Naruto mocked as he pulled out a gladius, the same one that had belonged to Spartacus. Don't worry about the senators, they will remember nothing after I leave, only that they, in their desperation to prevent you from leaving and possibly making yourself king of Rome, assassinated you. It was at that point, that Julius Caesar accepted his fate as Naruto stabbed Julius in the chest before Julius Caesar fell to the ground as well as pulling his toga over his head as a last action before he took his last breath and died. Unfortunately for Brutus and the rest of the conspirators, if they thought that by killing Julius Caesar, they have saved the Republic, they were wrong as they started a civil war that would leave all the conspirators dead and after defeating Mark Antony, years later, Octavian became Emperor Augustus Caesar as he was the heir to Caesar. Naruto didn't really care that he had partaken in events that would change the course of the whole world. All that mattered to him at this point was that his best friend could rest in peace. In the land of Camelot, currently a time of turmoil was happening. Cornelius Sigan, the greatest warlock the land of Albion ever knew, had managed to find a host body and was attacking Camelot by reanimating the gargoyles. One of the gargoyles was coming after Arthur Pendragon, the crown prince, right now. Luckily for him, and unknown to him as well, he had a guardian angel. Astrice. Merlin's spell easily shattered the gargoyle and he rushed to inspect his master friend. Merlin had come to Camelot a year ago, and had been serving and protecting Arthur with his magic since he was under the belief that Arthur would one day allow magic to practice freely in Camelot again. A chilling laugh filled the courtyard. It echoed in time to the pulsing energy that had become a second, sickening, heartbeat. Who would have believed it, you, a sorcerer, and a powerful one? Cedric's voice was different now, resounding with power. The power of Cornelius Sigan. I felt your power, little one, even as I lay so cruelly entombed. I won't let you hurt him, Merlin said with determination as he stood between Cornelius and Arthur. And you're going to stop me. The voice was mocking as Sigan stepped closer, a shuffle at a time. I'll stop you, Merlin said. 
He does not deserve your loyalty. He treats you like a. Cornelius said. That's not true. Merlin denied, even though it was kinda true. He cast you aside in favor of this host body without a moment's thought. Cornelius reminded him. That doesn't matter, Merlin said as he tried to deny it. But it must hurt so much to be so put upon, so overlooked, when all the while you have such power. Cornelius said, remembering the days when he all but ruled Camelot. Hell, he had built the place. That's the way it has to be, Merlin said stubbornly. Does it, you're young and inexperienced, Merlin. Look inside yourself, you have yet to glimpse your true potential. I can help you, Cornelius urged him. Think about it, Merlin. To have the world appreciate your greatness. To have Arthur know you for what you are. That can never be, Merlin said. It can, if you join me. Together we can rule over this land. Arthur will tremble at your voice, he will kneel at your feet. Cornelius said, as normal humans were not meant to rule over his kind. Merlin seemed tempted for a moment, but he quelled the desire, as it wouldn't be right to do that. I don't want that. Merlin said with finality. You'd rather be a servant, Cornelius said in disbelief. To Sigan, who had been the greatest sorcerer to ever live, it was unfathomable. The boy clearly had no self-respect, if he was willing to serve someone who treated him like a. Better to serve a good man than to rule as a evil one, Merlin said and this seemed to anger Cornelius. Cornelius was not evil, at least, not according to Cornelius. So be it, if you will not join me. I will take your body and your great power will be harnessed to my will, Cornelius declared as Cedric's body shivered and a blue mist left Cedric's body, killing the host body as Cornelius moved to take Merlin's body. Unfortunately, Merlin's natural power plus the ancient spell the dragon had taught him, were just enough to put Cornelius back into the heart-shaped diamond that housed his body in the first place. Yet, while Uther celebrated this, triumph, over magic, the Cornelius Saigon that Merlin thought he had defeated was not the true Saigon. Somewhere in Japan, Naruto woke from his bed in a stir, having sensed what was happening with Saigon. Hmm, feels like someone broke into my vault, Naruto thought as he sat up, thinking about the British Isles. For over 700 years, he had traveled all over the lands of Europe, Africa, and Asia. During his travels, he had done as he had promised his wife Ketsia on her deathbed, using his great power to protect witches and warlocks by killing those that would oppress them, and teaching them as well. Three hundred years ago, he had traveled to the Isle of Britain and met a man named Bruta Pendragon. Back then, Britain was engulfed in an endless cycle of bloodshed and war. Both men saw this, Bruta and Naruto wanted the land to be at peace, but for different reasons. Naruto saw the constant warfare as detrimental to the culture of the witches and warlocks who lived in Britain and Bruta wanted the endless war to stop so innocent people did not have to suffer for the blood and ambition of a few people. So together, they put an end to it when they gathered together the elders of each tribe and drew up plans for the lands to be divided in a way that each would rule over their land as they saw fit and respect the boundaries. And so, Bruta became Camelot's first king. Naruto worked under the name of Cornelius Saigon and served as Bruta's advisor for forty years, advising him on magical matters and building the citadel. After forty years, Naruto decided to leave to continue his travels, but not before sealing all the wealth he had acquired as Saigon inside a vault, leaving a small piece of his power to protect that wealth should it one day become discovered. He also intended to come back for that wealth one day, as Naruto had learned over the centuries that money and precious stones become worth more as time goes on. Seems I need to make a trip back to Britain, Naruto thought as he made to get out of bed, but was stopped as the two women in his bed woke up and pulled him onto his back. The regent of the witch community he was currently in and her sister were quite beautiful and he had slept with them a number of times during his two months stay. While he protected and taught witches, he also bedded them. His wife would have wanted him to continue living, and resisting the pleasures of the flesh was impossible for Naruto, as he enjoyed having far too much to give it up. He had taken other wives, countless lovers and sired thousands of children in those 700 years since Ketsia's death, and his children did not inherit his immortality though they did live longer than the average human. Hmm, maybe in a few more days, I'll make the journey back, Naruto thought as the regent moved to his while he had her sister. Three months later, Camelot, Aredian's guest chamber, Aredian, Merlin, Arthur, Uther, 
and Morgana watched the guards tear the room apart, trying to find evidence of sorcery. Aredian was a witchfinder, and had been called on to find the sorcerers in Uther's kingdom, after Merlin had been dumb enough to practice in the open. Aredian was actually a charlatan and faked most of it for money. He, in reality, had never actually found a sorcerer, until he discovered Merlin and Morgana. Once Gaius was dealt with, and Merlin's accusations debunked, Aredian planned to pay the boy back. You're wasting your time, Aredian said, check the cupboard over there, Arthur said and the guard obeyed. The second he opened the cupboard, dozens of amulets drop out, and a stash of belladonna tincture was found inside. Merlin had used a spell to multiply the amulet that Aredian used to frame Merlin and the belladonna tincture to exaggerate the threat of magic in Camelot. These things don't belong to me. This is a trick. Cough that boy plots against me. Aredian shouted in anger before he hunched over and spits out a toad, caused by another spell Merlin had cast the previous night. Sorcerer! Uther exclaimed as he, Arthur, and the guards drew their weapons. Aredian grabbed a dagger and the Lady Morgana, holding the dagger to her throat and backing up, using her as a hostage. Aredian, think carefully about what you're doing. You will never escape from Camelot alive. Uther warned him. Uther did not want his secret daughter to die. I will if you value the life of your ward. Hem. Aredian warned as he backed up further, hoping that Uther cared about Morgana enough that he would let Aredian escape. Merlin was about to cast a spell on Aredian's dagger, but just as he was about to, everyone was stunned when a blur passed through their line of sight, and suddenly, someone appeared in front of Morgana and Aredian, his hand on Aredian's dagger, holding it in his arm away from Morgana's throat. Morgana was able to see her savior for herself. He had a mane of spiky hair that reached his upper back and was so blonde that his hair appeared to be golden, his eyes a brilliant sapphire blue. He had a powerfully built figure and his black leather boots, black linen breeches, gray tunic and black leather trench coat did little to hide it. On his right ring finger, he wore a simple silver ring with the of a raven embossed on it. His most prominent feature though, was the three whisker birth marks on each cheek. You tried to kill one of my own, witchfinder, Naruto growled, not that Uther could hear it, as he gripped Aredian's throat with his free hand. You're gonna regret that, slipping his hand off of the dagger blade and onto Aredian's wrist, Naruto broke it with a twist before throwing Aredian into the far wall with one hand, the impact causing a visible spider web crack to appear on the wall as the witchfinder felt his spine crack and fracture and he cried out in pain. Naruto appeared in front of him and extended his own out toward Aredian's chest before he encanted a spell. A mock a crid, Aredian cried out as the skin and flesh in his chest tore itself open, before he groaned as the arteries and veins connected to the heart were forcibly severed before his vital organ flew out of his chest and into Naruto's hand, leaving a sizable hole in the witchfinder's chest as he died. Naruto ed the blood off of his hand, since as a true immortal, he still needed to consume blood every so often so his body could function like normal. Another sorcerer, Uther shouted in anger, Naruto turned to Uther, Arthur and the guards who were about to rush him. I have nothing to say to you, monster, only that the days of humans murdering and oppressing my people in these lands are coming to an end. Now sleep, Naruto commanded and everyone aside from Morgana collapsed to the floor due to Naruto's compulsion. Worry not, my lady, you're safe now. Naruto said with a smile. Who are you? Morgana asked. Not that she wasn't grateful but he was a stranger. My name is Naruto, although in this land, I am known as Cornelius Saigon. Naruto said as he fingered his old signet ring, causing Morgana to back up in fear. Relax, I'm not going to hurt you. You're an evil sorcerer, who tried to overthrow Camelot's first king. You attacked my home only months ago. You're supposed to be sealed back in your tomb. While Morgana was a witch herself, untrained though she was, Saigon's attack had put her life in danger. Who told you that I was evil? What lies have been spread about my origins these last three centuries? Bruta Pendragon was a good friend, and I helped him break the cycle of never-ending warfare in Albion, and establish the kingdom you know today. Hell, I built this very citadel with my magic. I left Albion after Bruta died and journeyed to other lands, while I left a shade to guard the vault that held my wealth. It only attacked Camelot because the idiot king broke into my vault and tried to steal my riches. Naruto said as his presence calmed Morgana, 
her magical instincts telling her she was safe around him. Now then, Naruto said as he sat on the desk, I've been back here for one month and the land of Albion has fallen into ruin. In every single kingdom, witches and warlocks, our people are oppressed, outlawed from practicing their craft, and in some kingdoms like this one, Amanda, and Odin's kingdom, our people are burned, d, executed, and tortured. The order of the high priests and priestess decimated down to maybe two members across both orders. Our people cry out for deliverance, and I'm going to give it to them. I could kill Uther now, but that wouldn't solve the problem. It's not just him, after all. But this started with him and make no mistake, he will die. Naruto said as he stood up. And on that day, you will not have to hide who you are anymore. What? Morgana asked. I'm not a fool dear. I can sense your magic. Naruto said. Magic is not something that one can just gain. We who possess magic, are born with it. Some just unlock the ability to use sooner than others. I come from a line of witches whose origins lie in lands southeast of Albion. I was born with it, as were my parents, and their parents before them. They were fortunate to live in a land of prosperity and not one where the land's kings declared war on sorcery. I, too, have known Uther's cruelty. Even before I awakened my magic, he threatened to kill me once when I helped a druid boy escape Uther's wrath. And every day for the past few months, I have lived in fear because if he discovered I have magic, he would kill me without a moment's hesitation. Morgana trembled in fear as she looked at Uther, hoping he wasn't hearing this. Magic is not a crime. It is a gift, a blessing, Naruto said as he concentrated his magic as causing a white rose to grow from the stone floor, before he plucked it from the ground and handed it to Morgana, causing her to smile. Our people deserve to live freely to practice their craft without fearing reprisal of those who have no place or right to judge us, of those who are beneath us. I can't stay much longer. Our people's deliverance won't manifest by itself. Before I leave, I have a gift for you. Naruto as he reached his hand into his private pocket dimension and pulled out a book. What is that? Morgana asked, as was fascinated by what it was. A grimoire, Naruto said, to her surprise and excitement. A book where a witch or warlock records all knowledge of their spells, hexes, rituals, recipes, and magical knowledge. This particular one belonged to a high priestess that I'm told recently passed away. It will help you learn to control and master your power, while at the same time, help you appreciate what all of our people are not allowed to do. But hide it well, I don't need to tell you what Uther will do if he finds out. Morgana clutched the book to her chest, as this was a magnanimous gift, greater than any she had ever been given before. Overwhelmed by emotion and feeling safe in his presence, she surged and hugged the immortal to his surprise. Thank you, this is a greater gift than I have ever been given. I'm grateful you like it, Morgana. But please, you must not be discovered. Worry not, we will see each other again someday. Naruto said as he sent her on her way, with her wrapping the book in a cloth. Naruto thought of leaving then, but he decided he wanted to talk to Merlin real quick, so he kicked him awake. Merlin groaned as he felt like he had a headache. Get up, boy, Naruto said as he looked down on Merlin. Merlin scrambled to his feet. Naruto inspected him and said, Hum, so you're the one who stopped my shade. Naruto was referring to what Merlin thought was Saigon. Who are you and what have you done with Arthur? Merlin demanded. Calm down, your prince is just sleeping. You are the one I wanted to speak with. Naruto said as he eyed Merlin. I don't get it. Don't get what? Merlin asked. Why would a warlock with your level power serve Uther Pendragon? Naruto demanded. I don't serve Uther Pendragon. I serve Arthur. Merlin said. And Arthur serves his father, so by extension, you do serve Uther. I ask again, why? Naruto demanded, compelling Merlin to tell him the truth. I believe in a fair and just land, where magic is not outlawed. The great dragon told me that it was Arthur's destiny to unite the land of Albion and that it was my destiny to help him. Merlin admitted, before he widened his eyes in shock. The great dragon, why would Kilgara help you? Naruto thought out loud while Merlin panicked. Why did I tell you that? What have you done to me? Merlin demanded. I don't have time to answer questions, boy. Naruto said as he sped forward, slamming Merlin into the wall, his hand on Merlin's mouth. Hope you don't mind if I take a peek. With that, 
Naruto used his telepathy to read Merlin's mind, looking specifically through his memories concerning Camelot. Merlin tried to throw him out, but Naruto was stronger by far. A few moments later, Naruto angrily threw Merlin to the ground. You, are, despicable. Naruto said as he glared down as Merlin. You would betray and murder your own kind. In defense of him, Naruto shouted as he pointed at Uther. It wouldn't be the right way. No matter what he has done, he doesn't deserve to die. Merlin exclaimed, only for Naruto to punch him to the ground. The hell he doesn't. Uther and all the rulers of these lands are abominations. Monsters. Naruto shouted. He wiped out thousands of his own people, just because he lost his wife due to messing with forces he didn't understand. His men butchered innocent magic users, d their wives and daughters, drowned innocent, s and babies. Burning my people at the stake, just for being different and better. Yet, no matter how bad Uther is, you're worse. Naruto as he lifted Merlin to his feet, choking him with one hand. You are in a position to end Uther's reign, and instead of doing that, you save his life. More than once, and kill your own people in the process. Yeah, some of them did abuse their gifts, but the others. The ones who wanted revenge for what that monster did to their families. So what, he deserves a thousand deaths for what he has done. Naruto threw him back down to the floor and towered over him, causing Merlin to cower in fear. I'm gonna let you go this time. But if you kill another of my kind or try to, there will be no saving you. Naruto sped away at a speed that Merlin, even with his enhanced eyes, could not track. Merlin feared for Camelot's safety with someone like him running around. The castle of Itershulas. Naruto arrived in the castle of Itershulas an hour later. H.E. was here for the Knights of Medir. Medir had been one of his students while he had been Cornelius Saigon. Her plan had allowed him to escape but he had learned that Medir became corrupted by the dark magic she used to turn the Knights of Medir into her unkillable puppets. Medir was innovative and intelligent, but she lacked willpower and discipline. Hope you don't mind if I borrow them, my old student, Naruto thought as he entered the room where the knights were centered around the brazier and used a spell to reawaken them. Knight is Medhires, Aeor Sala Sin Min Sala, Onwak and Calm Her Eft, Rid Eft Ond Fers Lea Eft, Gehu, Albion, as the old bones of the knights cracked and they reawakened under his command, he smirked as with them at his side he will have a much easier time ridding the land of those who would oppress his people. Amanta. If there was one kingdom that stood as a testament to the hatred of magic, it was Amanta. The kingdom was led by Sarum, a fat ball of lard that looked like someone took an egg, painted it, and then put hair on it. Sarum was a vicious sadist, seeming to enjoy impaling women and children. Particularly those with magic, he was also much worse than Uther. While Uther had killed several thousand of witches, Sarum had murdered nearly ten thousand in brutal and sadistic ways. Currently, some of Sarum's men were undergoing a weekly purge in one of the villages on Amanta's border, participating in an orgy of an murder. The men that followed Sarum were completely loyal to him, because they were as depraved and monstrous as he was. They terrorized their own people with glee on their faces. Poor young Mordred had somehow found his way here, after Arthur had attacked the camp of druids he had been staying with some months back. Come here, you ing druid whore shouted three of the soldiers as they pulled on Mordred friend and crush, Kara. Kara, Mordred cried as he tried to reach her, but he was pulled away and punched in the face by a solitaire, and then thrown to the ground. Two of the solitaires pulled Kara's arms apart and ripped off her dress as the third one started to unbuckle his pants. We are gonna have some fun with you before you die, he shouted with glee as he and his fellow soldiers were so inhuman that they were going to a ten-year-old girl. That all changed when a sword pierced him from behind. The soldier gurgled in shock as the sword was pulled from his chest, and the air shimmered as Naruto appeared, dressed in black clothes and all black armor. Naruto carried a very special blade with him. The blade was typical knight blade. The pommel was a blood red studded bevel. On each side of the bevel was the black three headed dragon. The grip of the sword was made of pitch black leather and blood red metal cord was wrapped around it several times. The blood red crossguard bent towards the blade some. Along the half of the blade that is close to the crossguard, blood red letters in the language of the old religion are engraved on a black setting on each side. The words say, fire and blood. This was Dark Sister. 
The legends about what a sword brandished or forged with dragon flame could do had begun with him, as he was the first to ever receive one. It had been a reward from Kilgara when the dragon was much younger and more brash, and lost in a duel between them. The one hundred soldiers raping and abusing the village stopped what they were doing. They were so used to their victims never fighting back, that they could not even fathom one of their own being killed. Murei na Sedairi, Kosein and Tuathane, Naruto shouted as he gave his knights orders. As one, the knights of Medir emerged from the shadows, and began killing the soldiers of Amanda with ease, while leaving the civilians alone. Naruto then sped at super speed to the two guards that were holding Kara, decapitating them both with a single stroke of his blade. Naruto then looked at the soldiers holding Mordred and Encanted, Forburn. The two guards then it up as they were engulfed in blue flames. While they burned, Naruto turned the naked and fearful young girl, and unclasped his cloak, and wrapped it around the afraid girl. I'm so sorry I wasn't here to stop this, my child. This should never have happened, Naruto said as he rose to his feet. Just stay here, I'll fix this. Naruto then moved off to slaughter the rest of the soldiers. Seeing one of their own control the knights of Medir and used them to save the villagers' own lives, and seeing one of their own fighting back gave these people something that had been beaten out of them, something they had given up on. Hope, hope for a better life, and the courage to fight and die for it, as some of the men and women picked up arms and began fighting back or blasted the soldiers with spells of their own. Later, as the piles of corpses burned, Naruto turned to address the fifty or so survivors of the attack. I know that many of you have suffered for years. Some of you, your entire lives, you have known nothing but persecution and violence at the hands of those that claim to be your betters. Some of you have prayed for a savior, to deliver you from this torment. Some of you have prayed that the savior would be Emery's. But, my children, Emery's is not the prophesied savior you hoped he would be. Emery's is currently in Camelot, masquerading as a servant and protecting Uther Pendragon, a man who is almost as bad as Sarum. My people, my children, you cannot wait for someone else to deliver you from torment. You must fight for it yourselves, for we deserve to live freely and practice our craft without being judged for being different. And if you follow me, I promise you, you will see that day come. Naruto shouted as his eyes glowed purple with power, which was mirrored by fifty sets of glowing golden eyes as the rebellion against the oppression of magic began. Two weeks later, in the capital of Amanta, the fat tub of lard known as Sarum was sitting on his throne in fear while outside his palace, his whole country burned. But not as it used to. Two weeks ago, one his raids on his people was stopped and one hundred of his men were killed. Rebellion swept across the land like a plague as thousands of Amanta's oppressed magic users formed an army to oppose his rule, uniting under the banner of a red tree on a black field. The red tree symbolized the Rowan tree, a very important symbol in the old religion. And against an army that could use magic, Sarum was shown the futility of fighting such a force as his army that was five times bigger was wiped out with barely any casualties on the magic user's side. Sarum jumped in fright when the doors to his throne room cracked and creaked under a great force, before they were blasted open, crashing to the floor and killing some of his soldiers. In strode Naruto with the knights of Medir at his back. Your Majesty, the immortal mocked as his knights killed the other Amanda knights, while Naruto sped over to Sarum and gripped him by the throat. I'd like a word. I want to show you something. Naruto said as he tossed Sarum into the courtyard, and the fat king was met with the glares of thousands of magic users as Amanda burned around him. These are the people you were supposed to protect. No, no, you can't do this. Sarum weakly pleaded like the wretch he was. Actually, I can, Naruto said as he ripped Sarum's clothes off until he was in his underwear. You have no right, I am the king, Sarum shouted, though his bravado was false and everyone could see it. Not anymore, Naruto said as he crushed Sarum's crown to dust in his hands. Naruto then used his magic to cause a tree to grow around Sarum, leaving only his head visible. This is your moment of triumph, my children. This man allowed your husbands and sons to be murdered and tormented, allowed your wives and daughters to be d. Take your vengeance. Naruto urged them on and the of magic users were overwhelmed by the desire for vengeance. PP please, Sarum pleaded pathetically but his pleas for mercy fell on deaf ears as twenty witches cast a forbearn spell, 
igniting tree and gleefully watching the fat king and the final tormentor burn to ash as he was slowly incinerated with the tree. Next morning, the capital city of Amanda was a ruin as Naruto stood on the steps of the palace, his army filling the courtyard and the streets, along with other witches and warlocks that weren't in his army. There were no non-magicals left in the kingdom, as Naruto and his army had wiped them all out. My children, Naruto spoke in a loud voice that reached the ears of everyone in his army, all of you have suffered at the hands of a man who believed himself to be your better, and treated you like you were less than dirt. Now, you are liberators. Together, we have freed Amanda from the grip of a tyrant and those that would help him oppress you. His army and even the civilians' witches and warlocks cheered for him. But, the war is not over. Naruto continued as they all were enraptured by his charisma. We will not lay down our weapons and calm our magic until we have liberated all of Albion. From Urturio to Cornwall, from the Western Isle to Kent, and Northumbria to Camelot itself. Women, men, and children have suffered for too long under the wheel of oppression of those who do not have magic. Will you help me break the wheel? Naruto asked his people, and resounding cries of approval filled the air. After what these people had suffered at the hands of Sarum and non-magicals, a land filled with only those with magic seemed like paradise. Naruto waved his hands and as if time was being reversed all the damage previously done to the city was reversed, returning the city and palace to perfect conditions. Inside, Naruto sat on a throne forged from the swords of the defeated enemies of his people as he plotted his next move. That was a rather rousing speech, came the voice of a woman in a red dress, and he turned to Morgos, the last high priestess of the old religion, entering the throne room from behind his throne. Our people have suffered for too long at the hands of non-magicals. It's time to change that. I am not normally an advocate for genocide, but Uther and his ilk have made it the only recourse. There will never be coexistence with magical and non-magicals in Albion. Not after what they've done, Naruto said as Morgos to sit in his lap. And I will be there with you to rebuild our people from the ashes when this is all over, Morgos said to him as they shared a passionate. When he had come back to Albion, Morgos had sensed his arrival and sensing his massive power, sought him out, hoping to gain a powerful ally to get revenge on Uther. Suffice to say, she was shocked at how old he was, as they exchanged information, with Morgos informing him what had happened to Albion since his departure, and Naruto explaining to Morgos who he was. Together, they had agreed to work together to restore magic to the land, and they had become lovers as well. Morgos, for the first time since her parents' death, felt at peace when she was in Naruto's presence. How's your sister? Naruto asked as he pulled away. She's doing well. I gave her one of our mother's bracelets and enchanted it so her visions would stop causing her restless nights. Morgos said, her power is growing by the day. You gave her Nimue's grimoire, didn't you? Well, she needed a powerful grimoire to learn from. Nimue was one of the strongest priestesses to ever live. Her knowledge will help Morgana become more powerful. Naruto said, How did your plan with Arthur go? At Morgoza's grimace, Naruto sighed. That bad, huh? For a moment, Arthur was going to kill Uther, but the serving boy, Merlin, stopped him. Managed to talk him down so he wouldn't go through with it. Morgoza said in annoyance as she was certain such a terrible secret would drive Arthur to kill Uther. Yet Merlin was able to talk Arthur down by lying his ass off. Arthur killing Uther would have weakened Camelot and kept them distracted while we dealt with the southern kingdoms, but it is no matter. We cannot be stopped, Naruto said wrapped an arm around Morgoza's waist. Now then, what do you say we celebrate this victory in our new bed? Naruto suggested as he sped them to his new bedroom, to celebrate their first major victory. Three months later, Morgana and Merlin were running through the halls of Citadel, trying to escape the night of Medir chasing after them and the sleeping king they were carrying. The entire city had been put to sleep, thanks to Morgana being the vessel for Morgoza's sleep spell. Morgana was fully aware of it, in fact, Morgoza requested permission to use her for the spell and Morgana agreed. The long three or so months of studying and practicing her craft as a sorceress had made her feel for her people that were oppressed and only magnified her desire to bring Uther down. It also helped that the army of the old religion, the army that Naruto and Morgos created, was already invading the kingdom. They had conquered all the kingdoms south of the Camelot and were now moving north to take all of Albion back for the magical folk. 
Morgana tripped and fell down, but Morgana was, in reality, keeping up her act until Arthur and Merlin finally fell asleep. Merlin, seeing this and being none the wiser of her true intentions, hesitated when she called out for him to help. He still cared about Morgana as a friend, but the dragon's words rang too deeply in his ear. He could not, would not risk the life off Arthur and since she was the source of the sleep spell that had Camelot asleep, she needed to die so with a heavy heart, Merlin continued to drag the sleeping King Uther away, leaving Morgana to die. Morgana, for her part, could not believe that Merlin, someone she still somewhat considered a friend, was leaving her to die. As the Knight of Medir drew closer and raised its swords she was filled with a righteous anger and that anger fueled her magic as she dropped her act for a moment and lashed out in anger at the knight, even though it wouldn't actually hurt her, since all the knights were under orders not to harm her. Forburn Ackwell. Morgana exclaimed her eyes glowing golden as a fireball came to life in her hand. To Merlin's shock as he had only ever seen Nimue do that. The former high priestess had nearly killed him with that spell. The blast hit the knight, leaving a gaping burning hole in its armor and sent it flying across the hall. And as Morgana rejoined him to drag Uther away, he was filled with fear at how strong she was becoming and more certain than ever that the dragon was right about her. Later. The throne room. You left me to die, Merlin. Why? Morgana demanded when Arthur went back out to fight the knights. Merlin, who had his back turned to her, was busy adding the hemlock to the water. He knew now he needed to stop her and was fully committed, even though it would be tough to do this to a friend, but he also didn't want to dirty his hands, so he would poison her instead. I'm sorry Morgana, it must be the spell. It's affecting my mind, making me not think straight. I swear I would never do that to you normally. Merlin said in the most Merlin Y way he could. This seemed to placate Morgana, though she was still angry and took the cup of secretly poisoned water he held out as a peace offering with an angry huff. Within moments of drinking the hemlock infused water, her throat began constricting and she had trouble breathing. Merlin wipes the tears of shame from his eyes and then turns to face her. Morgos sensed something is wrong as she pulls her sword out of a winded Arthur's stomach. Merlin tries to hold Morgana as she struggles to breathe, but Morgana blasted him away with a telekinetic blast in her distress. Morgos begins to hold her throat like Morgana as she senses what's wrong with her sister. She used her magic to blow the council chamber door open and rushes to Morgana, taking her from Merlin's arms. What has he done to you? Morgos asked softly as she held her choking sister. I had to, Merlin argued. You poisoned her, Morgos said in shock. The plan should have been foolproof. Both Morgos and Naruto figured that Merlin would be too sentimental where Morgana was concerned to do anything but it seems they had underestimated the boy's cruelty. You gave me no choice. Merlin argued again. Tell me what you used and I can save her. Morgos demanded of him. First, stop the attack. Merlin demanded. I will not be told what to do by a traitor to our kind. Uther will die here today. It's already too late to save Arthur. Morgos said with a sneer. Naruto had informed her about Merlin and sufficed to say, she was disgusted that this pathetic farm boy had all this power and instead of using it in service of his kind, he used it to protect the one that kills and persecutes them. What? Melrin said in shock as he heard what she said about him and then saw the blood on her sword and realized in horror that it must have been Arthur's. Before Merlin had time to get angry and fight Morgos, he was magically thrown against a far wall as a blur appeared next the two daughters of Golwa. I was already on my way when I sensed something was wrong. The army is an hour behind me. What happened? Naruto asked, holding a bloody dark sister in his hands. The traitor has poisoned Morgana, and I don't know what poison he used. Morgos said in panic at the thought of the sister she had just started to bond with dying. Naruto racked his brain quickly and remembered a spell that could save the young woman who was his lover's sister. I know a way, let me see her. Morgos handed her sister to the man and he held the dying woman in his arms. Egretter. Herga omne venenum ab hoc et mulier sonaim. Naruto said as his eyes glowed with magic and he ed Morgana on the lips, his spell working instantly as a golden aura covered their form as life returned to Morgana and the poison was purged from her body. Morgana had unconsciously drew herself further into the, before Naruto pulled back and Morgana coughed as fresh air filled her lungs. Morgos held and comforted her sister as Naruto stood and the Knights of Medir entered the room, 
one dragging the corpse of Arthur Pendragon, causing Merlin to cry at his friend's death. I warned you, boy, Naruto said ominously as he strode forward, I warned you what would happen if you tried to kill another innocent of our kind. Well boy, your luck has run out. And before Merlin could utter another word, Naruto swiftly beheaded him. Please finish up here more goes. I have a dragon to slay. Naruto sped away to massive dungeon beneath the castle that housed the dragon. Kilgaris Dungeon. The old golden dragon awoke when he noticed something was wrong. The old dragon sensed Merlin and Arthur's life fade from existence. But that should have been impossible. Merlin was born of magic, he was a unique creature that could only be killed by a sword brandished with dragon flame. And the only one with a sword like that Naruto Uzumaki, and he shouldn't be anywhere near Albion. K-H-I-L-G-H-A-R-R-A-H. Naruto roared, causing the old dragon to fly down as this was something he need to see. The old dragon landed in his usual spot when Merlin wanted to talk to him. Naruto Uzumaki, Albion has not seen you for a long time. Kilgara noted. Unfortunately for Albion, because if I had been here, people like Uther wouldn't be able to harm my people. I'm here to deliver your punishment for putting Merlin up to killing Morgana. Naruto growled. The witch would have been the death of both Merlin and Arthur. But it hardly matters now. They are dead, and with it, any chance of a peaceful coexistence between man and magic in Albion will die. The dragon said, I have feared this moment ever since I helped Merlin defeat your shade. I know what you plan to do, but I beseech you, old friend, not to kill me. I am the last of my kind. If I die, my noble race will be no more. You should have thought of that before you plotted to kill an innocent woman. Naruto said before he threw Dark Sister at Kilgara's chest at a speed no human could have followed. The sword pierced through the dragon's tough scales and the point found the flying lizard's heart. The last dragon roared in agony and then his roars of pain died, as did he. Naruto pulled the sword from the dragon's chest and went back upstairs to see to the slaughter of all the non-magicals. Once everything was settled, Uther would be executed. Two weeks later, Camelot's throne room, Morgana lounged on the throne of Camelot, the golden crown resting on her head, while Uther, who was bound in chains, was dragged in by four guards. They roughly tossed him to the ground and he struggled to rise to his knees as he had been starved and beaten for the last two weeks. The guards then exited the room, guarding the doors to the throne room. Father, Morgana bit out derisively, her words full of venom. She had discovered, thanks to a heritage ritual performed by her sister, that Uther was her father. Morgana hated Uther and now she would have to live with the fact that the man who once threatened to kill her for defying him, was her father. Why are you doing this? Uther asked pathetically, he was a sad sight to look at with having not eaten in a long time had caused him to lose a lot of weight and was almost gaunt. That would have been a sad sight, yet the bruises from his hourly beating made him look more pathetic. Oh, come, come. Surely you of all people must understand. Sometimes such measures are necessary. Morgana mockingly chastised him. Those people were innocent. Uther pleaded with her as he had been forced to watch all of his people be slaughtered like sheep. Well, the non-magicals, at any rate. As were so many of my people that you put to death. Morgana told him with a scowl as she glared at the kneeling king. You have no right to complain. You, despite knowing that I was your secret bastard daughter, your blood, threatened my life, simply for doing what was right. Is it really any wonder that I genuinely feared for my life, when I became one of the people you hate and revile unjustly? Uther could not find words to counteract her argument. He had done exactly as she had. He chose to plead with her instead. Kill me. You'll get your wish, but not just yet. First I want you to suffer a little more as I suffered. To know what it's like to be alone and afraid. To be disgusted with who and what you are. Morgana told him as she examined her donor. He was already somewhat broken from watching magicals take over the kingdom, all the non-magicals being slaughtered, and the death of his son. But he was not fully broken. Not yet. At any rate, there was still one thing he cherished, that she could destroy. And she would. Do you really hate me so much? Uther begged to know. Words cannot describe the depths of my hatred for you. Morgana told him as the doors opened to reveal Naruto himself walking in. Father, I'm sure you remember this man. He saved my life from the that nasty witch hunter. 
he also is the one who showed me the goodness of magic. Morgana said as she lavished praise on her savior, twice over. She then turned to Naruto. Have you given any more thought to my proposal? I have considered it greatly. And I have spoken about it with your sister at length. She has no problems with it. And I would be honored to return your love, Morgana. Naruto said with a smile as he wrapped his arms around her and they shared a. What? Uther asked as he did not understand before he realized who this was and what this meant for his daughter and his bloodline. No, no. That's right, father. Morgana said when she pulled away from Naruto. Naruto has agreed to become my husband. Our child will rule over all of Albion once he is full grown. And it will be a kingdom for which kind? A paradise for users of magic. And now, you will go to your death, knowing that your descendants shall be the witches and warlocks that you tried to wipe out. Morgana returned to her soon-to-be husband as Uther was dragged away by several soldiers. The next morning, Uther stood on pyre, tied to a post in the middle of it, binding him as his daughter prepared to execute her bastard father by burning him, like he did to so many witches. Morgana stood with her sister and Naruto on the balcony that Uther stood on whenever passing sentence on a witch. My fellow witches and warlocks, Morgana addressed her kind that had gathered to watch this tyrant die. The monster before you is guilty of many crimes, including persecution of our kind unjustly, and murdering us in the thousands. For the crime of judging us and persecuting us for crimes we never committed, my sister, the high priestess Morgos, and my betrothed, Naruto Uzumaki, have both recommended he burned at the stake, like he did to so many of our people. What say you all? A resounding roar of approval came from the crown. Morgana smirked down at Uther, who looked up at her pathetically, his eyes watering with tears, no longer able to resist or utter a word. Naruto, Morgana, and Morgos all concentrated their magic and incanted the most basic old religion spell for fire. Forburn, they said in unison. Their magic ignited the pyre underneath Uther and he screamed in agony as his skin charred, his blood boiled, and his insides were cooked. Morgana breathed a sigh of relief as her new husband held her against his hard body and her sister stood next to her as her donor died down below. At last, Camelot was free of the tyrant Uther and soon Albion would be a paradise for magical people everywhere. Naruto looked out of the balcony of his castle as he stared out into the night. He was thinking about the vampire population. In the last few years, the number of vampires has doubled and increasing faster than it could be contained. Naruto, of course, aware of originals and the problem they represented. He was at least aware of the fact that they could not be killed like ordinary vampires. He needed to do something about that and soon. His thoughts turned to Albion. For five centuries, magic lived openly and could be freely practiced and it was indeed a paradise for magicals everywhere. But eventually, non-magicals grew too numerous, too numerous to slaughter all over again, so the old religion was forced to go underground. But this was far better than the alternative of the old religion dying out completely. Because of Naruto's intervention, Morgana and Morgos live to this day as his wives, leading the magical communities of the Britannic Isles. Because of Naruto's intervention, the old religion never died out, and was considered the leader of the magical communities worldwide, at least in the Eastern Hemisphere. But right now he had other things to concern himself with, like his wife Morgana Pendragon, who walked into their bed chambers. Naruto only had to turn around before his lips were assaulted by his wife's. Naruto and Morgana ed each other passionately when, Naruto slipped away from the and started to lay s on Morgana's open as he groped her ass. Morgana squirmed under his touch as her own hand started running through his hair. She moaned as Naruto kept her while his hand started to roam over her body. The two kept as they continued to moan into each other's mouths as they made their way over to the bed. Before long, the level of clothing she and Naruto had on started to frustrate her. Naruto kept his workings going as he felt Morgana pull away from him, and grab the collar of his tunic before she pulled it off of his body, and tossed the piece of clothing aside before she pulled Naruto into another. Naruto ripped the back of her dress open all the way down to her waist and she slipped out of it to reveal her naked glory to him and pushed him onto the bed before she straddled him. We have been apart for too long. I've missed you, husband. Morgana growled. Naruto smiled up at Morgana as she started to grind herself along his hardening before he ed her stomach up to her s and took her left into his mouth. Morgana, 
S breath hitched as Naruto's free hand came up and started to knead her right before she slid off the bed while taking Naruto's pants with her. Once she had them off, she threw them into a corner, as her free hand started to slowly pump his member eagerly. Naruto smiled as he met eyes with Morgana while she continued to stroke Naruto's, before she brought her other hand up and began to play with Naruto's large balls, causing him to moan, as she kept her twisting her hand and jerking him off as she started to fondle his ball sack. After 20 seconds of fondling his balls and stroking him, Naruto was full mast at 10 inches long, 3 inches thick. He pulled her back onto the bed and flipped them over so she was on her back and he positioned himself above her as she spread her legs. Naruto ed her, before he thrust forward and speared his into her, causing Morgana's back to arch and scream slightly as she was penetrated. The tightness and wetness of her, causing him to moan, before he at her, an ear. Morgana grabbed his face, before she pulled him into another, as she started to roll her hips. Naruto groaned before he slowly pulled out of Morgana's hot until just his head was resting in her and then plunged back in. He started a slow rhythm of pulling out and thrusting back in before he started to pick up his pace. Morgana loved the feeling of Naruto's pounding into her but after being away from her one true love for a week, she wanted to be ed into the floor. As if reading her mind, Naruto's hip became a blur, as Morgana moaned when he hit her cervix she leaned up, and at his. His ministrations quickly brought the immortal witch to climax soon enough. Naruto continued to piston in and out of her before another orgasm ripped through Morgana's body as he kept thrusting into her G-spot. Once she came down from her second orgasmic high, Morgana, using her magic to flip Naruto over so that she was on top, before she started to ride him. Naruto moaned before he leaned up and ed her. Before moving to her and biting her, drinking some of her blood, which caused her to scream in pleasure as she climaxed for a third time, and Morgana rode him faster than before as he started to thrust up into her. After a minute when he felt her clamp down on his member, he thrust his member into her cervix, before he shot his load into her baby chamber which sent her tight sheath into another round of convulsing. End. After another two hours of aim, Morgana laid down on Naruto's chest, as she placed soft ass on his chest, I love you. Morgana said happiness clear in her voice, a far cry from the scared and frightened woman she was when they first met. As I love you, Naruto replied as he pulled the covers over them. There is something that I need to talk about to you about. It's the reason I came back early. Morgana whispered as she lay her head against his chest. She was supposed to be gone for a whole month, visiting the individual communities across the Britannic Isles. What is it, love? Naruto asked. I had vision, Morgana said, gaining Naruto's attention. Morgana was a true seer, after all, and after centuries of practice, she was finally able to control it. We need to convene the Council of Yggdrasil. While I was away, I summoned them here. They will be here in three days. The Council of Yggdrasil was the council that met every so often to discuss and determine matters of great import to which kind. The leaders of all the major witch communities gather in one place. Morgana and Morgos led the old religion in England, so they were always present at when the council was convened. If Morgana thought the council needed to be convened, then it was really bad. Council of Yggdrasil The council had been convened and every leader of major witch communities were here, plus Naruto, since he was widely revered amongst all of them. Now, the meeting was getting started. Why was this meeting called? Lady Morgana, asked the leader of magical community of Egypt. There is a growing threat that has been discussed at this council several times in the last 200 years. Vampires, Morgos answered, causing all the witches and warlocks present to groan. A menace, this species is. Their population grows like roaches. In the last 50 years, their numbers have reached my country. Answered the Chinese-looking man, who lead the communities in China. That is all true, but this is bigger than that. A group of the oldest vampires is currently gathering in Constantinople, coincidentally at the same time as the Suleiman II is attacking the last vestige of Orthodox Christianity. They're being formed under the leadership of the original, Elijah Michaelson. Morgana informed the others, causing the other members, minus Naruto and Morgos, to gasp in shock. A group of old vampires forming an organization was a disaster waiting to happen. It may not affect them immediately, but it would affect their descendants, and they could not allow that. This is a catastrophe, one yelled. 
If they are allowed to form this organization and worse, it grows in size, they can accumulate so much wealth and control the kingdoms from the shadows. Another said. Forget that. What about our people? The older they get, the harder these bluters are to deal with. If an entire group of them were to get old enough, they could end our descendants. Another shouted, and soon everyone was throwing worst-case scenarios back and forth. My friends, please control yourselves, and sit down. Naruto said, his voice carrying over their shouts, his soothing aura helping to calm their nerves and they soon calmed down enough that the meeting could continue. Your concerns are all valid ones. Fortunately, my wives and I have a solution for this problem that will allow us to nip it in the bud, before it can become problem for our descendants. What is this plan, Lord Naruto? The Chinese leader asked. There is another original vampire out there in the world. One that hunts his children. His name is Michael, and he is actually the father of the originals. Naruto said, the plan is quite simple. I will capture him and we will use him as our weapon to destroy this organization before it can become a threat to us. Michael will then actively hunt the originals so they cannot set up roots anywhere like this again. This is a great plan, my lord, but I would like to propose an additional plan, something to add on to this one. Naruto motioned for him to continue. We need to take a more active approach in dealing with the vampires. This organization will be handled but who's to say that other vampires will not take a similar approach? What are you proposing, exactly? Morgos asked. That our communities form teams of witches and warlocks to hunt down vampires that grow too old and those that are dangerous enough to become a threat. He said. The other leaders seemed to agree with this idea, so Naruto retook the momentum of the meeting, this is a sound suggestion. My wives and I will develop the spells to combat these vampires and determine their ages, and we will reconvene in a year to formulate how these task forces should be developed. For now though, I have an original to catch. Outside Constantinople, the clash of steel could be heard as two of the oldest warriors fought the battle that would determine the future state of the supernatural world. Naruto used a uppercut with his sword to knock Michael's sword out of his hands, but the Viking deflected the blade, and spun to regain position. Naruto brought his sword down on Michael's with one hand, which was blocked, before spinning around, his twirling sword meeting Michael's two times, before Naruto finished his spin and sliced at Michael's chest, which was blocked. Naruto swiped at Michael's legs, which was parried, before swinging to decapitate the Viking, though Michael managed to block it, and force Naruto's blade to the side. Michael stabbed at Naruto's chest and Naruto parried him. Michael grabbed Naruto's free hand before he brought his blade down. Naruto brought his blade up and defended himself in the awkward position. Naruto blasted Michael with a quick burst of blue lightning, forcing him off and allowing Naruto to regain his position. Naruto's storm of strikes and slices fell upon Michael and forced him across the forum. Naruto and Michael locked blades for a moment and Naruto maneuvered it out the way. Naruto brought his sword down in a one-handed overhead strike while channeling lightning through his blade. The enhanced katana sliced through Michael's sword like butter and cut through his chainmail, ribcage and left lung. Then he threw him against the wall of a nearby building, holding him with one hand by the. Michael then pulled out the white oak stake and tried to stab Naruto in the heart but Naruto grabbed the wrist and held him there. Foolish vampire, that stake doesn't work on me, Naruto said as he stared Michael in the eye, now stop resisting me. His compulsion worked and Michael relaxed in his grasp. Shock overcame him, followed quickly by anger as he demanded, what is this? I am an original, I can't be compelled. You vampires are nothing but cheap knockoffs of me. Is it any surprise that the superior model holds such sway over the inferior? Naruto asked rhetorically, before he continued his compulsion. Now, you're going to destroy the organization that Elijah has formed in that city. You're then going to hunt down your children and terrorize them for the rest of your days. Also, you will feed only from vampires from now on. You will also not remember me compelling you. The compulsion took effect and Michael glared at the city before rushing off to destroy the Strix, Naruto following behind him to mop up any of the vampires that Michael might miss. 1917. Christmas. Outside Monterey, Naruto walked through the forest into the village of Monterey, thinking about the past. It turns out that using Michael as a weapon had been the right decision. The originals were constantly on the run from the Viking madman, 
not able to set up roots and always having to look over their shoulder. Also, the suggestion to form task forces to hunt down vampires that got too old or would be problems later, was still in effect to this day. It was because of this decision that there were very few vampires in the world that lived over the age of 250. In the old world, it was almost impossible to find any vampires at all. Naruto actually estimated that had he not done this all those years ago, there might be 100,000 vampires in the world. Because of the task forces, there were less than a thousand collectively. Most of them lived in America because the witch communities were more laid back. It also had the effect of there being thousands of werewolves alive in the world, since there were no old vampires that could band together and exterminate the packs in droves. One of the communities near the village he was walking towards had tipped him off about a savage vampire that gorged on human blood to the point he ripped their heads off. From the way things looked, he could see this was the case, as the severed heads of the villagers littered the place as Naruto walked in. Naruto heard the sound of someone writing on a wall, and went to investigate. He found the man inside the destroyed home, writing names on a wall. Are they your victims? Naruto asked rhetorically. The man turned to Naruto and Naruto could not help but widen his eyes, because it was the face of Silas, a face that he had not seen in 2000 years. Leave, or you will go up there with them. The Silas look-alike tiredly said as he ignored Naruto and went back to writing names. Silas, Naruto muttered before he grew angry that the traitor had somehow escaped, so Naruto sped over to Stefan at a speed even an original vampire could not have followed and threw him against the wall, gripping his throat as he held him there. I don't know how you got out of that tomb Silas, but you're going back. Before I do, I'm gonna figure out who was stupid enough to release you from your prison. Naruto said as he delved into Stefan's mind, looking for the information. Naruto did not find what he was looking for and quickly saw that this Stefan Salvador was not Silas. He saw Stefan's whole life, how he fell in love twice as a human, became a vampire, and was cursed with blood he couldn't control. Naruto initially had every intention of killing him. In all his years on Earth, no monster he had come across had ever massacred an entire work camp on Christmas Eve. And yet, when he looked into Stefan's mind, he didn't see evil, only anguish. Naruto let him down and both gasped. You can see inside my mind, can't you? Stefan asked. It's horrible, isn't it? Take me. I deserve it. I was made into a ripper who craves blood all day and all night. I'm a monster and I don't deserve to live. Kill me, please. Stefan even dropped to his knees, hoping for the sweet release of death. He couldn't stand living like this, a monster that craves blood, an addiction he fears he will never be able to control. Naruto stared at the vampire. This was awkward, to say the least. He had engineered the very series of events that lead to vampires by and large being an endangered species. And this vampire was clearly one of the worst offenders. Yet, it wasn't his fault. The boy wasn't doing this on purpose. He was suffering because he could not control his hunger. Naruto did not believe it would be right to kill this young man, whose only fault was an addiction he couldn't control. He's not like the vampires that would have formed the Strix, all of whom were egotistical psychos and he wasn't like Michael, who was a violent savage. Killing him wouldn't be right. So, there was only one thing to do. I'm not gonna kill you Stefan Salvatore. Naruto said, causing Stefan to look up at him. It's clear to me that it isn't your fault for being like this. It's your brother's. Killing you wouldn't be right. So instead, I'm gonna help you. And in time, you will see that you are not the monster you think you are, and that you are worthy of a life. Naruto finishes the declaration by extending his hand out to the kneeling vampire to take which he does, helping him up and beginning Stefan's long road to recovery. Klaus was in a parking lot leaving a voicemail for Rebecca, Rebecca, where are you? Pick up the phone, darling. Michael is dead, it's time for a family reunion. Receiving another call Klaus switched to it, Stefan. Miss me already. I'm just calling to thank you for my freedom. Stefan said. Oh, I like to believe I'm a man of my word, more or less. Klaus shrugged. Thing is, it came at too high of a price. You took everything from me, Klaus. Let bygones be bygones, trust me. Resentment gets old, Klaus said as he approached his truck in which he transported the caskets. You know what never gets old, 
Stefan asked as Klaus opened his truck to see the caskets are gone, revenge. No, Klaus said wide-eyed, what's the matter, friend? Missing something, Stefan asked in a large room with the caskets. What are you doing? Klaus asked, getting payback. It's not fun when someone steals your free will. Stefan said, I will kill you and everyone you've ever met. Klaus threatened, you do that, you'll never see them again. Stefan said, you caused this, Klaus, so get ready because now, you will suffer. Klaus hung up the phone in anger. Back with Stefan, he knew he had just kicked a massive hornet's nest. Although he was royally pissed off at Klaus for taking away his free will and making him shut off his humanity, making him feed on his girlfriend, and undoing almost a century of hard work containing his ripper urges, he was not so angry that he didn't think he needed backup. Sifting through his contacts and finding the number he wanted, he took a massive sigh and hit the dial button, putting the phone to his ear, waiting with dread for the man on the other side to pick up the phone. Hearing the phone pick up on the other side, Stefan's heart jumped into his throat when he heard the voice of the man he feared the most in the world, Stefan. Naruto, Stefan said with bated breath. You had better have a good explanation for why you fell back into your old ripper habits, Stefan. Naruto said with annoyance and anger. Do you remember what I told you after I helped you gain control of your blood back in 1917? I remember. You said that you would only spare me once, and after you helped me gain control, you said if I returned to my old ways, you would kill me yourself. Stefan said with dread. But look, I can explain what happened. If it wasn't for the fact that you hadn't killed any witches yet, you wouldn't even be allowed the chance to make your case, old friend. Naruto said as he could be seen standing outside of a balcony in London, looking out towards Parliament. Now, start talking. So, Stefan told him all about what happened. How Catherine Pierce had come back to Mystic Falls. How Stefan and the gang had managed to outwit Elijah several times when he came after Elena. How they had failed to stop the sacrifice of the doppelganger and that Klaus was now a hybrid. How Stefan had given himself over to Klaus in exchange for healing his brother of his werewolf bite, which would only happen if Stefan went back to being a ripper. How Klaus had first failed at making hybrids then figured out how to buy using Alina's blood as the catalyst to finish the transition. How the gang had awoken Michael, only for their plan to fail at killing Klaus since Stefan botched it to save Damon's life and acquire his freedom from the compulsion. By this point, Naruto was listening intently. Hold up a moment, Michael the vampire hunter is dead. Yeah, Klaus stabbed him with the white oak stake and killed him right before he released me from my compulsion. Stefan said. Naruto HM med in deep thought. With Michael dead, Klaus had nothing standing in his way of creating an army of hybrids. He had already created a dozen or so hybrids before Catherine Pierce released Michael from his tomb. Naruto and the witches had worked diligently to eliminate the vampire race over the last millennia. The population of the vampire race was down to maybe about 100 members. Naruto allowed only very rare exceptions. The Michelsons, because the species of oak needed to kill them was basically extinct now, and reformed vampires like Lexi Branson and Stefan Salvatore. But Klaus being allowed to create more hybrids would put the werewolf species in mortal peril. Naruto sighed, you're lucky I like you so much, Stefan. Give me one week and I'll be there in Mystic Falls. I still have some business to attend to here in London. Naruto said as he hung up. He'd have to finish his meeting with Morgana and Morgos a little earlier than expected. Stefan hung up the phone as well, knowing that he would need to lay low for a week. He didn't want to take his chances without backup in case things go south. One week later, Mystic Grill, I feel like I'm going crazy. Totally paranoid all the time. Elena said to Bonnie who sat across from her. You have a right to be. Klaus is still out there and he knows you tried to kill him. Bonnie said eating a French fry. Why hasn't he made a move? There has been no sign of him. Nothing. Just my slow spiral into insanity. Elena stressed. Join the club. Every time I close my eyes, I have that nightmare. On repeat. The same dream. Elena asked. Yeah. Four coffins. Klaus in one of them. It's weird. Bonnie explained. What if it's not just some dream? What if it's like? Dot you know, a witch dream? Elena asked. It's just stress. I'll figure it out. And what about Stefan? Has there been any sign of him? 
He betrayed us Bonnie. The Stefan that we know is gone. Elena said dramatically. How is Damon handling it? Bonnie asked with a raised eyebrow. Damon is. Damon. Elena said. Bar. Damon and Alaric were sitting at the bar, with Damon having a lot of different alcohol bottles in front of him, while Alaric was reading something. Oh. I give you a choice. Bloody Mary or screwdriver. Brunch in a bottle. Come on Rick, I can't drink all this by myself. I mean I can but then somebody's getting naked. Damon said as he looked at the female bartender who looked back smiling. Oh man I can't believe you're making me drink alone. He whined. I'm busy. Alaric said without looking up from his work. Damon looked to Alaric with a raised eyebrow. It's the eve of Klaus Klausageddon. You're doing homework. This may come as a shock but I am not here to hang out with you. I'm here to see Jeremy who is an hour late for his shift? Alaric said. Kids today, where are their values? Damon asked mockingly. Alaric put Jeremy's midterm paper on the counter which had the title, American History 201. It had an F. That's his midterm paper. Copied it straight off the internet. Didn't even try to hide it. Alaric said in disappointment. Oh, somebody's getting grounded. Damon said. Did you say you were waiting for Jeremy as in Jeremy Gilbert? The bartender asked Alaric. Yeah, he was fired last week. The bartender said. Oops. Damon said going back to his bottles, while Alaric looked over to Elena who was at her table. Old witch house. Naruto walked up to the old house, opening the door, sensing that Stefan was there. As he headed down to the basement, the voices of the 100 dead witches that usually hung around the house seemed to sing and rejoice. That should not be a surprise though. They knew who he was and how important he was to Witchkind. When he got down to the basement, he found it empty, with only Stefan present. Hello, Naruto, Stefan said, still a bit on edge. They may be somewhat friends, but Naruto's first priority had always been Witchkind. He would not hesitate to kill Stefan if he ever harmed a witch, and that was the primary reason why Stefan never hurt a witch, regardless of whether his humanity was on or off. Been a long time, Stefan. Though I wish we were meeting under better circumstances, Naruto said as they shook hands in greeting. Well, like I said over the phone, I could not do a whole lot about Klaus stealing my free will, and I really didn't want to try to and fight him without backup. Stefan said as Naruto walked around a bit, examining the coffins. So, these are the coffins of the original family. I always wondered what the appeal was about carting your siblings around in boxes. Looking at it now, I still don't get the appeal, Naruto said, noting there should only be three coffins for three originals, yet there was a fourth one. He would have to sort that out later. He turned back to Stefan and said, you've brought me here and asked for my help, now, you will listen. Follow my lead and you will see Klaus suffer. If you don't heed me, you'll be the one suffering at his hands. Okay, so what's first? Stefan asked, eager to make Klaus suffer for ruining his life. Later, Elena was on the phone, leaving a message for Jeremy, while Damon was shooting darts. Jeremy, the minute that you get this call me. She hissed before she hung up as Damon got another bullseye, unbelievable. You're feisty when you're mad. Damon flirted. It's not that I'm mad. I'm just I'm worried, Elena explained. But why? He lost his job at the grill. He can survive, Elena. He is spiraling. Ever since he stopped seeing Vicky and Anna. He is moody, he is not really talking to anyone. It's typical teenager, Damon shrugged, who's seeing ghosts and has lost everyone that he cares about. Elena replied, not everyone, he still has you, Damon said before he went to retrieve his darts from the dartboard. You okay? Elena asked, what makes you think I'm not okay? Damon asked, well, you're day drunk, it's not exactly your most attractive look, Elena said. Hum what is my most attractive look? Damon asked flirtatiously, as he moved closer to her. Ah, ah I'm not saying you have any attractive looks. I'm saying this is my least favorite one. Elena said with a small blush. Noted. See if I can make any improvements. Damon said, turning back to the dartboard, causing Elena to sigh before she looked behind her and her eyes widened as there stood Klaus. Don't mind me, Klaus said as he leaned on the table. Klaus. Elena said in fear, you gonna do this in the grill, in front of everyone, it's a little beneath you, don't you think? 
Damon mocked as he stood protectively in front of Elena. I don't know what you are talking about. I just came down to my local pub to grab a drink. Klaus said. I'm surprised you stuck around town long enough for happy hour. Damon said. My sister seems to be missing since she called me about Michael. Need to sort that out. Klaus said, looking at them for any signs of deception. Cute blonde bombshell, psycho. Shouldn't be too hard to find. Damon deflected. Truth is I've grown to rather like what's become of my old home from 1000 years ago. Think I might fancy a home here. Oh I imagine you're wondering how this is affecting you. The answer is, not in the slightest. As long as I get what I want and everyone behaves themselves you can go on living your little lives however you choose. Klaus said as he grabbed the darts. What more could you possibly want? Elena asked. Well for starters, you can tell me where I might find Stefan. Klaus said as he threw some darts. Stefan skipped town the second he saved your ass, Damon said. Well you see that is a shame. Klaus said in anger as he threw a dart and got a bullseye, embedding the dart in the wall behind the bullseye. Your brother stole something from me. I need him found so I can take back what's mine. Klaus said. That sounds like a Klaus and Stefan problem. Elena said. Well, this is me widening the scope, sweetheart. Klaus said menacingly as he walked out the bar, letting them fret over what he might do. Later, Klaus Mansion. Klaus was staring out the window, sipping blood, I'm surprised you're still in town. I gave you your freedom, you could have gone anywhere. Stefan was leaning against a doorframe, true. But this is my home, Klaus. I live here. Well, if we're playing this game, I was here first. Klaus pointed out, you know, I'm hurt. I hope that when I freed you, we'd pick up where we left off. But here you are, guzzling vervain like the rest of them, I'm sure. So much for friendship. A real friend wouldn't have stripped me of my free will and forced me to hurt the girl I love over a difference of opinion. Stefan pointed out, still sour about that whole ordeal. Okay, granted, yeah, that was a little extreme, but I get a little moody. Just ask my siblings, speaking of whom, isn't it time you handed them over? Why, so you can keep storing them in coffins like some ridiculous trophy? Naruto's voice came from behind Klaus, causing him to turn around to examine the new face. And who might you be? Klaus questioned Naruto. I'm the guy who fixed Stefan's ripper problem after he ripped through Monterey on Christmas Eve in 1917. Ordinarily, I would have killed him, but I was feeling merciful that day. Naruto said as he walked around Klaus to stand next to Stefan, Klaus eyes widening in surprise as nobody knew that Monterey had been slaughtered on Christmas Eve. Klaus, Stefan said, drawing the hybrid's attention back to him, get your hybrids out of Mystic Falls, or Naruto and I will remove them ourselves. Hmm, you see, if you continue to threaten me, I'm gonna be forced to retaliate. Kill people, and it will get messy again. Klaus threatened right back. Two hybrids walked in at that moment, having heard the commotion, is everything okay? The female hybrid asked, standing behind Stefan glaring at him. Everything is fine, Mindy. Stefan and his friend were just leaving after failing to make their point. Klaus said, as if challenging them to do or say otherwise. Stefan burst forth in a flash of speed, grabbing a hacksaw that was laying on the table next to him and cutting off Mindy's head before she even knew what was happening. Naruto's smirk grew wide as he snapped his fingers together and the other hybrid combusted on a molecular level, exploding in a shower of blood, bone, and gore. Klaus looked on in shock at the display. He was surprised that Stefan was able to kill one of his hybrids so easily, but he was truly shocked at how easily this Naruto fellow killed the other hybrid, apparently using magic to kill the hybrid effortlessly. Stefan turned back to Klaus. Well, that's too down. You might want to send the rest away before things get messy, again. Stefan threw the saw down. Naruto looked at Klaus as he edged the hybrid blood that had splattered onto him off his fingers. You have one hour to heed our warning, boy. Otherwise, you can say goodbye to the rest of your hybrids. Klaus looked at the corpses and back to where the vampire and immortal had stood in anger. One hour later, Klaus, mansion, a hybrid named Daniel walked in with Mindy's corpse and the other hybrids on a stretcher. What do you want me to do with them? Just get rid of them. I honestly don't care, Daniel, Klaus said. 
Daniel walked away as Tyler entered and saw the corpses before walking up to Klaus, you called. I'm here. What happened? What happened is Stefan and his friend had two paths in front of them and they chose the one that made me angry. I need you to help me do something about that. Klaus smiled. Can't you just leave me out of it? Tyler asked. What would be the point in that? Klaus asked with a raised eyebrow. Seriously man, you've got, like, 15 other hybrids that could do it. Why does it have to be me? You're making me lose my friends, you're ruining my relationship with my girlfriend. Tyler listed off, though Klaus stopped him when he brought up Caroline. Right, you're, uh, your girlfriend. Um, about her, I need you to bite her. Klaus said as Tyler looked shocked and horrified. Outside, Daniel struck a match and set the corpses on fire and watched as it burned before he turned to leave. It was then that his enhanced senses picked something up. Frowning, he turned to the fire and Stefan appeared right behind him as he chopped his head off with a knife hand strike to the base of the inside. Tyler looked at his sire in horror. What? Don't make me repeat myself. Klaus said in annoyance. A hybrid bite will kill a vampire. Tyler said. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly what it will do. See, Stefan and his friend pushed me too far, so I'm pushing back. I'm not biting Caroline, Tyler said like that should have been the one thing he would never do. Tyler, I've been supernaturally blessed with the good fortune of a sire bond to you. So, one could consider this me putting your undying loyalty to the test. Klaus said with a hand on Tyler's shoulder. What the hell is wrong with you? Tyler glared at Klaus, who frowned as Tyler threw Klaus' hand off his shoulder, I'm not hurting Caroline. Good for you, kid, Naruto said causing the two to look up at him as the hybrids who were working stopped what they were doing, it's adorable really but you still would have ended up biting her, even if you don't want to. The sire bond messes with the subconscious part of your mind like that. What are you doing here? Klaus asked. We gave you one hour. Time's up, boy, Naruto said ominously. Klaus growled and vamped towards Naruto, who snapped Tyler's before throwing him to the floor grabbing the heads of two hybrids speeding for him and smashed their heads together, turning both into paste. Klaus punched Naruto in the jaw, though the only thing it really did was move his head a bit. Naruto retaliated with a punch of his own, burying his fist into Klaus' stomach, causing him to gasp in pain as the original hybrid was sent flying through one of the barely renovated walls. Klaus's hybrids tried to rush to their master's aid but Stefan appeared with a machete in hand, cutting off several of their heads with one fell swoop. Klaus looked at Naruto, as he got to his feet, you're strong. Klaus noted in trepidation. I'm the oldest being on this planet. Naruto smirked, causing Klaus to scoff. You lie, Klaus said. Klaus rushed in with a swing but Naruto leaned out of the way, letting Klaus swing several more times, before he caught one of Klaus' wild swings. I was born in Greece around 100 BC and lived through the rise of Julius Caesar and Spartacus Rebellion. Naruto said, before he caught Klaus's other hand, holding him there, as Stefan killed several more hybrids. I was already ancient by the time your parents were born. Naruto said as Klaus struggled against the immortal's superior might and got his bones crushed for his trouble. There is a millennium of difference between you and me, child. Naruto said as he headbutted Klaus fracturing the hybrid skull and causing him to shout in pain. Naruto Spartan kicked Klaus in the chest, sending the hybrid into another wall. As the original hybrid struggled to get up, his back against the wall, Naruto walked over to him slowly, snapping his fingers and killing the last few hybrids that Stefan hadn't killed, causing them to explode in showers of gore. A fight between us, will always end with you groveling on the ground. Naruto finished. Naruto picked him up by his collar. Klaus growled through the pain he was feeling and tried to punch him, only for Naruto to catch the fist, and pulled the hybrid's middle finger so far back that he ripped it off halfway, exposing the bone. Naruto then threw Klaus against the wall before kicking his face into the wall three times. He pressed his foot against the hybrid's chest right above the sternum, collapsing his entire chest. Naruto then punched Klaus in the face several times and slammed his head against the wall, finally knocking him out. By now, Aside from Klaus and Tyler, all the other hybrids were dead. Let's go, Naruto said to Stefan. Nighttime, Klaus groaned as he awoke and sat up and reset all of his bones. Once he began looking around, 
his eyes widened seeing all his hybrids dead, Tyler missing, and he frowned as his eyes darkened before he let an enraged yell. Old witch house. Haven't had that much fun in a while. Naruto remarked as he and Stefan shared a bottle of whiskey over their little victory today. It had been a long time since he had given his supernatural muscles a good flex. The last time was probably when he pushed back the lichens for the final time before he and his wife Ketsia used a ritual to devolve them and send them to the new world. The vampires that came after the originals were not strong enough to make him give an honest effort and Michael had been easily subdued back in Constantinople. You know, all this time I've known you and I've never actually seen you fight before. You are, exceptionally brutal. Stefan remarked as the whiskey traveled down his throat. He hadn't been able to even see Naruto move when he used his super speed, but he was able to see the aftereffects of the exceptional damage that he did to Klaus. Only to those who've earned my ire. Naruto pointed out. Speaking of which, while slaughtering Klaus's hybrids was fun and all, none of it's gonna really matter if he can just replace them in the morning. Stefan said. I know, your pretty little girlfriend is still in danger. Naruto said as he set his glass down. I know and I don't really know what the right choice is. The only thing I can think of is maybe turn her into a vampire. Stefan remarked, as it was the only thing he could think of that would render the nature of her blood inert. That won't be necessary, Naruto said, causing Stefan to look at him. How? Let's just say, there's very little magic can't solve. I can develop a potion that will change the magical nature of her blood, just enough that it is rendered useless in all things magical. She'll still be human and all, but her blood will no longer contain the magical properties that make it a potent ingredient in spells. Although, I am going to need to study her blood to do this correctly, so, you are going to have to bring your girlfriend to me. Naruto said as Stefan understood him perfectly. Elena may very well never forgive him, but as long as she had her magical blood, she would always be Klaus's machine for making hybrids. This was for the best. If she ended up hating him for it, well, at least she would have the freedom to do so and not be of Klaus. The end. Now we will see you in the next video if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends.